criminals are essential for revolutions in this kind of kind of macro social um, like social movement level and that well they're essential on the one hand and it's essential for other people to either give them a pass or to even lose the ability to see them in the Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mind Matters. On this week's show, we're going to be discussing the criminal mind. And I think each one of us has been reading uh, something different on uh, an aspect of criminality uh, throughout history. But we're especially going to be focusing on the um, officially sanctioned criminality throughout history, when governments act like criminals, when uh, criminal morality becomes the status quo, and when um, criminal behavior becomes something that you are forced to engage in yourself if you want to have any sort of um, financial or political success in your life, and also um, that you will be victimized uh, by, or that people have been victimized by um, since time immemorial. Um, not, and not just your average kind of crooks in high places and corruption, but we're talking here about blatant criminality. And in previous shows, I think actually maybe even before we started doing the YouTube show, we did a couple shows on the criminal mind. Um, a book called Inside the Criminal Mind by Stanton Same now, which is um, quite a quite a tour de force, really, uh, throughout the book. I can't remember exactly when it was published, but there was a 2014 revised edition that was uh, that was published. And in that book, uh, Stanton Same now kind of lays out all of the flaws in our thinking about criminals and the way they think, and how for years and years and years and years, sociologists, academics, criminologists have been looking for the causes of criminality in the um, in the social environment, you know, whether it's due to poverty or if it's due to neglect or if it's due to emotional abuse or this or that. But uh, in that book, uh, Same Now just kind of throws all of that um, to the side and instead investigates how a criminal thinks and what a criminal's attitude towards family or towards work or towards society is in general. And in conducting that type of an investigation using that method instead of looking at the causation of criminality from the outside like it's society's fault that a uh, criminal is the way that they are he looks at it from a very different point of view and shines a new light on the phenomenon of what it is like to have the mind of a criminal and this is something that we will be discussing today because it has implications for understanding the minds of criminals throughout history, criminal enterprises that begin, let's say, for example, in the case of the Bolsheviks with the destruction of the, or the looting of the looters, right, the expropriation of the expropriators and the destruction of the capitalist class with all these uh, highfalutin, nice social justice type phrasings or phrases but when it comes down to it it's just the robbery uh, it's wholesale robbery of in the case of the bolsheviks the entire uh russian country mm. and and i i know that each of us has been reading a, a slightly different book on that but i've been reading uh, sean mcmeekin's history's greatest heist the looting of russia by the bolsheviks and in that book he it basically just uh, after these uh, Soviet archives were opened up uh, just in the recent decades, uh, historians and academics have gotten a good look into the business of communism in, in Russia and the, the fact that there really was no business. They didn't produce anything of value. They took power and then they robbed the country. They robbed the banks. They robbed the people. They robbed the Romanovs, they murdered them, and stole all of their diamonds, rubies, antiques, paintings, and held the entire country hostage, um, destroying the banks, nationalizing the banks, going in and, you know, guns drawn and ro literally robbing at all of the banks and outlawing any kind, uh, any kind of... Um, 
normal uh, financial transaction so that they could take all of the money because they needed all of the money because they could not produce anything of value. They had no plan and they were in the business of uh, being criminals. Mm. And that's interesting. He points out in the book, the fact that we have all of these, mm, all of these films and movies of Nazi crimes uh, mm. released throughout Hollywood in the, in the West. And, you know, they received numerous awards, but about communism and, and you, never see you never see them you don't you don't get to uh uh you don't get a very accurate portrayal of the sheer um venom uh, venomous nature of of the the soviets the bolsheviks and their rise to power and the really truly at, at its base um level criminal activity that took place in the the murder and the uh, wanton savaging of the entire Russian <laughs> country. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, today I know that each of us has been uh, been reading uh, something different on this subject, but that's really what we want to get down into is just the nature, the criminal nature. When you just take it all away, what does it mean to want to um, take the wealth away from the rich and redistribute it to the poor? Mm -hmm. What is the real intention behind such a such a slogan? Is it... Is it highfalutin or is it the most brazenly criminal um, act of stealing and uh, of convincing you not only to help them steal, but to give <laughs> to give all of your money um, because it's such a, a lofty goal? Mm. Well, I want to I want to take off on how you started this with the Bolsheviks, because when we were talking last week about what we were going to talk about this week and I mentioned a quote, I'll paraphrase it because I can't remember the exact wording, from P.D. Uspensky's Letters from Russia, I believe, which was a series of letters he wrote during the revolution while he was still in St. Petersburg, I think. Um, and it, the, the the editors were then collected and edited by Alfred Oraj and then published in, the, uh, in this form. You can still find them online. And um, one of the things he said was something like that this isn't, this isn't the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie it's the dictatorship of the criminal element basically that the criminal element had taken over and oftentimes when you read youtube comments or even you just talk to people about communism in in the ussr and uh, especially if this person might have um a kind of predisposition predis predisposition towards liking communism or like you know being slightly on that end of the totalitarian spectrum then they'll, they'll often say things like oh well stalin was the only bad one of course you'll get people who say stalin was the only good one but stalin kind of perverted the revolution and you know created this totalitarian state but uh before then it was it was real communism or so, you know something like that we've had a few comments on our channel words to that effect whenever we talk about communism i mean you're you're bound to get a few idiots here and there who um will say something like that but when you actually look into those first years of communism, the revolution to, you know, through the rule of Lenin, you'll find, you know, it, it, it may not, in some ways it may not be as bad as Stalinism, but in other ways it was worse and just as evil. There's, I, I really can't see much difference on the, on the personal level. But between both of them, because Lenin was just as much of a like a you know son of a bitch, and the the revolution was anything but uh, a walk in the park or a you know a a, a nonviolent uprising against a um, you know an oppressive regime. It was as Uspensky described it, the criminal element taking over. So tying that in with what you said about how these things are justified, the Bolshevik Revolution, and it and it's just one. I mean, it, it can it was one of the biggest, but can apply to so many others and so many other dynamics, even not on the level of a national revolution. But when you look at the that dynamic, there is usually a, like we've said, I've said this repeatedly on the show before, whenever we talk about similar subjects, there's basically a legitimate grievance or um, inequality or oppression or something of that sort in order to get people riled up. That's often the case, and sometimes it might not even be a present one. It could just be a historical one, but often it's a present one. It doesn't really matter. It's a, a grievance of one sort or another. And what usually happens is that 
people get riled up over this grievance and then want their, you know, quote unquote freedom. And that sentiment or that desire might be perfectly understandable and even justifiable. But what then happens? Um, well, the, the nature of a revolution of this sort, a revolution from below, is that you get all these people that are clamoring for justice, clamoring for freedom. And that goal, that, that um, mission or that aim that they have, then becomes the most important thing. And I said it doesn't just apply to revolutions. This actually applies to all kinds of different situations in human life, whether it's a... Uh, a religious group that you join, um, or a political party, or any kind of um, movement, or you know anything of that sort, where that becomes the most important thing. And when that becomes the most important thing, of course, other things lose their importance and aren't um, aren't relevant to the goal. So, if our goal is a national revolution to tear down the system, then all of a sudden, other things just become less important. Like they're, we can shove things under the rug, we can ignore other things because they might get in the way of us achieving our goals. So what you then have is um, a situation where there is a goal such as a successful communist revolution. And then one of the specific things that gets downgraded is the awareness of and importance of um, recognizing the criminal mind, the criminal element. Because when you start looking at your revolution and saying, hey, wait a second, we've got a lot of criminals in our midst, then the, the, the second that you acknowledge that to yourself or to others, well, one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to be targeted by the criminal elements that are, you know, all around you, or you're just, uh, if everyone kind of acknowledges it, then your revolution aut automatically just loses all of its steam because you realize that you're just um, totally... Um, what's the word like not infiltrated, but you're you're saturated with the criminal element so You have to ignore that or go along with it in order to achieve your goal because otherwise then you get involved in infighting your Oh, well, let's cleanse the cleanse our ranks, you know from with all from all the criminals <clears throat> Even if you would do that You'd quickly find that you don't have anyone that's willing to do the work necessary to stage a successful revolution and Then you're dead in the water so really, criminals are essential for revolutions in this kind of kind of macro social, um, like social movement level, and that the, well they're essential on the one hand, and it's essential for other people to either give them a pass or to even lose the ability to see them in the process. I think that's what actually happens: is that people seem to lose the ability to recognize that someone else is. A criminal and and that that has implications for how they should be interacted with how if they should be um, like socially accepted or not because in normal society criminals are aren't socially accepted and that's for a very good reason um, but, but before we go in that direction I want to get back to the criminal mind itself and same now because in his book um, like when I hear talk about criminals my mind immediately immediately kind of um, goes to like be a devil's ad advocate and say, well, wait a second, what do we mean by the criminal mind here? Because do all criminals have a criminal mind? Well, what does it mean to be a criminal? All lawbreakers, everyone in jail. And then if you, if you look at the, like the, the breakdown of like the, de the demographics of criminals, I think that you could probably make a case that a, a portion of those, I don't know how big, if how, how many, if it's going to be 0.1% or 10% or 30% or 40 are going to be involved in in um, either crimes, like just stupid crimes that shouldn't even be illegal, or um, or minor crimes, or or you know, or they'll be framed or something. But you see what I'm saying, right? That uh, wh where do we actually draw the line between a criminal and a non-criminal? Um, I can't remember how Sam now does it because um, I can I can guess that even if you look at someone who well, even if you, even if you include in criminal in the criminal class, everyone who knowingly breaks a law, then I can understand that division to a to an extent because there it does take a certain personality type to knowingly break a law. Let's say to knowingly 
um, steal from someone or to knowingly, knowingly assault someone if you know it's illegal and know it's wrong, you know, quote unquote. And I'd say that despite the, the, the myth of Robin Hood, I, I think that the, the actual incidents of Robin Hood-like personalities is probably very low that, you know, among people that are, that are, um, stealing, I don't know how many, um, I, you know, I'd be, inter I'd be interested in some kind of in-depth study, right, into the, uh, into just a simple crime like theft, you know, what are the different types of theft, what are the different mo motivations, how many people are stealing bread to, you know, to feed their, uh, their children, and how many are stealing, like, you know, Samsung TVs, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but re disregarding all of those kind of minutiae, what Same Now basically demonstrates is that among, let's say, what everyone could agree on, the kind of, like, um, career criminal, or even people that, um, that are seemingly normal for a long period of time and law-abiding, but then get arrested for something just totally off the wall, right, that seems out of nowhere. Um, this was something he wrote about in, in the book called The Myth of the Out-of-Character Crime, was that it? Um, or worse to that effect, something like that. And and showing that among even among career criminals and this class of people who seem law-abiding for a long time but then get caught doing something, um, there's a, in the latter case, there's a, either a point at which they break, if I'm remembering correctly, or it's just the first time they've gotten caught. Um, that they've been actually engaging in criminal behavior for a long time, and then when they finally get caught, people are like, oh, this came out of nowhere. But with all of those varieties in mind, what he does is is show that there is a, um, what he basically sees and argues is a criminal personality, that criminals tend to think the same way. And this has a lot of overlap with psychopathy, with the psychopathic uh, mindset and worldview, which, um, you know, it, like I said, it's been a few years, year, a few years since I read same now. So, um, if you guys remember more details, just chime in. But what it basically comes down to is just almost a, um, an extreme self-centeredness and se like a sense of one's own importance and that, that they are more important than everyone else. And, Special allowances should be made for them, but not others. It's basically like you, if you inflated the three-year-old mindset into a, you know, an adult, you'd get this criminal mind. So if someone else has something and you want it, well, I don't have to work for it because I shouldn't have to work for it because I deserve it. So therefore, I should be able to take it from that other person. Um, what you have is mine just simply by virtue of the fact that I... And better than you and I don't have to work for it you did the work already so I'm just gonna take it from you because why not you know I deserve it I'm great um, a, a good a good example that comes to mind is watching like dr. Phil clips like the cash me outside girl right where just a complete complete narcissism and and belief in one's um, you know in one's own value over and above everyone else like I was just watch I just randomly got a um, a, a deep fake recommendation on YouTube of some guy had taken those clips and just put Dr. Phil's face on on all of the people in in that clip. So the girl, her mom, Dr. Phil, the people in the audience. Um, but it reminded me of the actual encounter between these between Dr. Phil and this girl, and her just saying that. Well, he, he asks her like, why do you t why do you uh, why do you steal vehicles? Like, why do you steal cars? And she says, well, it's there. The keys are there. Um, like people know I steal cars. If you're just leaving the keys there, then you deserve it. So, um, so not only do I deserve it, but it's the other person's fault for being in the situ for basically being in the same vicinity as this criminal. Because, well, if you're in the same room with me, you know I'm going to do something to you. So why are you only why are you even here? It's your fault. It's just one variation on the blaming the victim. That's part of the criminal mind. Is it <laughs> not only am I not only do I deserve it? It's your fault for me doing to you what I've just done to you. Well, on, on that one point, having watched the Cash Me Outside Girl <laughs> video interview with Dr. Phil and her mom, uh, it's very clear that she has taken on all of the affectations of a stereotypical yeah. uh, black woman. Um, 
so which betrays a kind of uh, identification with, and also you might add a, a truly racist uh, perception of of something that she inwardly admires and aspires to emulate and uh, and enact for herself. And one can argue that she is so devoid of any individuation or character development uh, that so little has taken root in her in her young life that she has um, she has taken in all of these and romanticized all of these uh, these these ridiculous uh, tropes of of what a what a criminal uh, black woman uh, is in her perception and has become that uh, to the max. And it's almost a, you know, if, if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't sad and, and tragic in a way to see this young person, uh, be such a behave like such a shit, uh, it would actually be pretty funny. And I think, I think a lot of people do find it funny, uh, precisely because it is so over the top, yeah, a caricature of herself, a character, a caricature. And, um, it, it really does speak to, I think the um the the lack of any kind of uh instruction uh in in just the very subject of psychopathy or or character development that that a lot of people um are are lacking uh and speaks to you know the 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 kind of uh degeneration in people that makes them so vulnerable to any kind of identification or hero worship with uh, the criminals, the criminal mind. Um, quite often, uh, and we'll we'll post some pictures of this. Especially in pop culture, we see you know T-shirts of Jeffrey Dahmer or uh, the Tony Montana uh, character of Scarface, who's very charismatic. It's very entertaining. But it's also horrific. It's it's also quite disturbing. It should be disturbing, uh, but it's become a that I don't know what it's become. It 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 certainly isn't cool and ironic in the way that some people might perceive it to be. Uh, it, it's it's a you know for lack of any kind of internal um, value system uh, or or structure. A, a a moral failing that people would in any way identify with with these these pop culture heroes, and there's also uh, we have a picture of uh, Mike Tyson with a tattoo of uh, Chairman Mao uh, on his on his arm. Uh, you know, Mike Tyson. However much we might have rooted for him or liked him as a boxer in his heyday. Uh, displayed some sociopathic tendencies as a, as a very young man before he got into boxing. So, you know, it would make a certain amount of sense that he would identify with the, the strong man, the powerful leader, uh, and see fit to put that tattoo on his arm. I forget what it, exactly what it was you said a moment ago, Harrison, um, but, but there was a, a quote here that spoke to some of what you were saying. I'll just read it. Researchers from Emory University recruited 696 men and women to report what they were looking for in a person to date, to have a short-term relationship with, or a long-term relationship. They were given a list of 70 characteristics to choose from, taken from the DSM-5 classification for personality disorders. <laughs> Generally, romantic interest in psychopathic traits was low. But participants who scored highly on the psychopathic spectrum themselves were more likely to prefer higher levels in a partner. Quote, to a large extent, our findings support a, quote, like attracts like hypothesis for psychopathic traits. So, you know, just taking this on the more macro level, uh, it's clear that there are many individuals out there who, even if they're not essential psychopaths or, or full-blown malignant narcissists, do have some character disorders and deficiencies in their, 
in their thinking, in their behavior, that uh, lend themselves to being vulnerable to, being attracted to figures uh, in in ideological movements and in, in political movements, quite simply because they they're not even aware of their of this hole of this of this deficiency that automatically and subconsciously creates this connection in their minds, this like attracts like to to figures who are criminals. Now there's a, a quote uh, in Political Panorology. This is a book we've made reference to several times here on the show and um, by Andrew Lobachevsky. It's really, uh, folks, if you haven't read it yet, it, it's, it's one of the sine qua non uh, bits of reading for understanding uh, not only how psychopaths operate in some ways, but how they influence large movements. Uh, political and social movements in particular, and and couldn't be more relevant for the types of movements that we've been reading about and hearing about in the news these days. So one of the quotes is that uh, ideologies don't need spellbinders. Spellbinders need ideologies. And what Lobachevsky means by a spellbinder is someone who's going to get on the soapbox who's going to spout some bit of Marx or, uh, or communist ideological readings, uh, or who's going to fashion those statements to their own purposes. And really this is, it, it, it has almost nothing to do with the ideology itself. It's just this criminal mind appropriating these ideologies for their own power, their own three-year-old desire for what the other guys got. So just replacing spellbinders or someone who is is uh, almost hypnotically entrancing people into their vision of, of what they're owed, into, into what they should believe, we can say that um, ideologies don't need criminals. Criminals need ideologies. And so, you know, the, again, this gets back to exactly the types of things that we're, we're reading about in the news. I mean, the numbers of stories that, that are coming out about these Antifa and Black Lives Matters groups that are organized and headed by pedophilias, pedophilias, and, and, uh, and human traffickers and people with criminal records. I mean, if, if that doesn't ring any bells, if that doesn't wake anybody up as to the direction or the, the real intent uh, behind these movements, the power behind these movements, uh, then you know you you really ought to be questioning your own un- broader understanding of how things work. I think. Yeah, <clears throat> I think a lot of that uh, that attraction from the general population towards uh, towards criminals. Uh, throughout history it goes back to like what Harrison was talking about about the necessity of criminals in a revolution and that that does make them attractive to people who have a certain um, perspective on the powers that be and the you know and a certain perspective role that the powers that be have played in whatever um, perceived injustices whether real or um, or illusionary, um, but that the criminals therefore play this this uh, this role on the you know on the grand stage, and you know where everybody likes anti heroes. You know that's there's something fun and interesting about anti heroes, and and uh, oh he's going to stick it to the man, and you know you 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 root for the underdog. You know that's a you know that's a big genre. That's a big subgenre in you know film and TV and. And it's something that I, you know, that it it helps to bypass your more critical faculties, um, and also it helps that most people don't really have the criminal mind; and they don't have access to it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like an evolutionary psycho- uh, psychological theory. We have this little subunit they say of that's called theory of mind, um, the theory of mind subunit, and we're always um, 
we're always unconsciously trying to register why people do things around us. And we generally we try and form theories of mind based on how we would react if we were a, a person or how our parents reacted. And it's all mm-hmm. this very, this big jumbled um, mess of of assumptions about why people do the things that they do. But, you know, it's it's necessary in order to predict people and to know how to interact with people to have some general idea of how they will, you know, what you should do and how they'll react to what you do. But unless you were... Um, somebody who was so unfortunate as to have uh, sustained contact with somebody who had a um, a severely pathological and malignant, um, you know, sociopathic or psychopathic personality, we, as human beings, we don't um, have access to the depths of evil that, you know, these individuals um, have. Uh, that that really that once you start stripping away the mask of the anti-hero and of the revolutionary um that like you were saying alan what you get what you find what you discover is the pedophile you discover the um you know in the in the case of the bolsheviks that i was talking about in the intro to the show you you find uh, individuals who will tie a family up and murder them so that they can um you know murder them uh uh, hastily and horribly, not, you know, not even a, the kind of a clean kill you would expect in a hunting expedition, if you know, with a with a wild animal, but just, just stabbing, just stabbing and shooting, um, and just so that you can steal their diamonds, just so that you can take their, their their gold and their art. That that this is, a, I think Lobachevsky refers to it as something of a striptease that most people don't want to have conducted for them because we want to believe that these revolutionaries, these mafia men, we want to believe in the ideology because we don't want to think, um, A, in a lot of cases that we've been hoodwinked by con men, and B, that there is really um, behind this this mythos, behind this ideology, that there, it, there really is just the this um, stalking kind of predator just licking its lips mm-hmm. because it's very uncomfortable to, yeah. it's very strange to, um, to think about. And especially when it's difficult to think about because that's the whole point of the con of the idea of the ideology is to make sure that you never even question uh, the, the stated aims um, until, you know, in, in many cases until it's too late and, and then you, you don't realize it until, you know, until it's too late. But, you know, books like Political Ponerology, Inside the Criminal Mind, and, you know, many uh, history books on revolutionary periods, they reveal that, you know, that um, not that every revolution is uh, is a failure, is some moral failure, because obviously there are problems with the powers that be. Mm-hmm. And in every country and throughout time, there's always been corruption and there's there have been legitimate revolutions and there have been legitimate usurpers and overthrowers of of corrupt uh, power structures. But that there is, once you open that door, um, if you're not aware of what's on the other side, uh, what the uh, oftentimes what's on the other side is much worse than what you you thought, and especially in the case of of individuals who uh, have this criminal mind, um, which believes in free lunch for them, and you're going to have to pay for that free lunch. You know, they, we don't care about the details of how you run an economy. We don't care about the details of how you're going to pay your workers or how people are going to get food. None of that's important. All that's important is that we get what we want, we get the power, and then we're just going to rob you blind and you, uh, good luck sorting it all out because uh, who cares? It's, you know, the, those details are, um, are irrelevant to individuals who have this mindset that says, I, um, I'm, I'm better than everyone else. I deserve to be in power. You know, that's it, like Stanton, same now, he writes about that in the book, um, you know, numerous case studies of criminals who uh, they're like, well, you know what? I would go to work, but I just couldn't stand to, th- to th- for my friends to see me flipping burgers, 
You know, I mean, if I'm going to go to work, I should be the CEO. Or when he, yeah. you know, conducts interviews with prisoners, uh, they're like, well, when, when I get out, I'm going to start my own business. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? What business are you going to start? Ah, I don't know. I'll figure it out when I get out there. Oh, well, do you have any idea how to start a business? So like, no, just stupid details. I don't need to know how to start a business. You know, I, <laughs> it's just I'm, I'm owed that or I believe that. I'll say it. I'll tell myself that. Um, very self-centered short-sighted and um and prone to you know saying whatever um just kind of believing that whatever you say is reality you know pretty much that that actually while you were saying that i was imagining instead of a criminal in prison saying it it would be the revolutionary leaders who are who are being questioned it's like oh so so what are you going to do when you get out of prison it's like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna start a revolution you know take over the country it's like oh well so how how are you gonna well well how are you going to run the the economy? Oh, you know that's it'll just, it'll just happen. You know I, th- that's just a detail. You know we'll figure it out when we get there. <laughs> yeah. And that's essentially what plays out. Like that's what played out in in China and with Mao's revolution during the Great Leap Forward. It's like these guys had no freaking idea what they were doing, and had all these harebrained schemes and ideas that, like uh, I've been talking about this book I've been reading to you know whoever will whoever will listen to me. Mao's and great. Now family. it's going to be all of you. Yeah. <laughs> and and just how. It, it seems like every freaking idea these guys had was completely bonkers and the wrong decision. And every decision they had was the wrong decision. So so they had all of these plans and every one of them was an abject failure and co- almost the complete opposite of what they should have done in order to get something to work. So everything just completely fell apart. Like uh, the, the idea to kill all the pigeons. It's like Mao had the great idea. Okay, well... You know, the pigeons are causing havoc on the, to the crops or whatever. So we're just going to have a, uh, we're going to organize the entire country, the, the entire nation of China on a, on a series of days. And I, I can't remember, I can't remember how, la- how long it lasted, if it was a series of days or weeks, but where everyone was mobilized in the entire country to just kill every pigeon they, sh- they saw. And of course they were just shooting all birds, um, but killing like basically wiping out this entire bird species. And of course, then that led to an extreme, like, uh, overgrowth of of like insects and it just caused this spiral effect that where one thing one problem caused another problem which caused another problem which needed another solution which caused another problem and it was just a series of disasters one after the other all from just this piss poor leadership um and same thing with farming like they had all these innovative new farming ideas like oh we're going to do close cropping and we're going to do um deep digging like trenching where they they dig like you know four meters into the ground to churn up the soil and they put all these ideas together and meanwhile the actual farmers are looking at them like you know i don't think that's going to work and it's like oh no this these are new revolutionary farming ideas it's going to work and of course it doesn't work the it, like record low crop yields everything goes to crap and um the the regular farmers all they could do was go along with it because they had to do what the guy above them was telling them to do and they were the ones with guns and or you know clubs or whatever they would use to to beat them up when they weren't when they didn't follow orders and that's uh well on that subject you're talking about the uh, the, the almost striptease how we don't like to have the truth revealed to us about the the nature of a of a, a criminal not just because we don't like the feeling of being conned and being hoodwinked and we don't like to either admit that to ourselves or to have that exposed to others the only thing worse than being conned is having everyone else aware that you were conned and that uh that basically there's something wrong with you and that you're so so naive and conable essentially so you don't want to admit that to yourselves or others but now imagine that on like the national level where you have to it's it's not just someone you've interacted with it's the it's your entire government structure who you have probably been um through one means or another inculcated to believe in and to support like through just patriotism so now what are you going to do in that situation are you going to to um tell yourself that all of these people that you're supposed to admire, that everyone else admires, that you probably admire, are actually just, you know, base criminals when it comes down to it? Well, probably not. But tying this back to the Bolshevik Revolution, because something, of course, similar happened in, in Maoist China, that when everything was collectivized and nationalized, or, you know, the, the, the state assumed property ownership over everything, 
it wasn't that it wasn't that the the party was appropriating all of the wealth of the country it was simply that it was all being redistributed so the the the, the wealth all of the wealth and all the property in the country was no longer individuals it was the people's so so your your uh cooking spoon was not your cooking spoon it was the people's cooking spoon or you know your frying pan was not your frying pan it was the people's frying pan so what that means in practice is that the the party militias and the and the the communists would come around and take your spoon and take your frying pan and everything else in your house your your furniture um your clothes and take it to the collective facility because it was no longer yours it was the people's and so these people the actual people just suddenly found themselves without anything and so they were forced into these uh um collective these collectives where they like canteens where in order to, in order to eat you had to eat at the canteen and everything was parceled out for you so no longer could you grow your own food and have enough to eat you had to rely on someone else telling you how much you could eat because um how does the the marxist slogan go you know to each according to his need well yeah and we determine how much you need and if you don't work you don't eat because you don't need anything because you're not part of our collective um you know utopia so that was Lenin's phrase, um, as Dick Cooter put it, says, puts it in this book, is that that's, the slogan was, you know, to each according to his need. But in practice, it was um, Lenin's slogan, which is, if you don't work, you don't eat. Mm. So grandmas and people who were sick were simply starved to death. And if you, and getting back to the criminal minds, um, Maoist China made everyone a criminal because you had to be a criminal in order to survive. So if you stole a handful of rice, you could get beaten to death, and many did. And if you stole that to give to your grandma, your grandma might get beaten to death too, and uh, made an example of. And there's just a, a litany of the just the horrors of what went on in the during the the Great Leap backwards. Um, maybe I'm, I just want to read a couple just because just to give an idea for the you know the people who haven't really looked into it. Um, I, I think I mentioned on the, on one of our previous shows when I mentioned this book that, you know, I wasn't sure, sure about it at first, but, um, this guy wrote all, wrote this book entirely based on actual communist party docu documents in China. So these are from official reports, uh, official, official investigations by the communist party themselves. Um, so there's no like, uh, um, you know, foreign propaganda that's gone into the equation here. This is actually Chinese propaganda, <laughs> and uh, and what it uh, what it says about what was actually going on. Um, so I just want to read a few sentences here and there. He starts out this chapter on violence um, by writing, "Terror and violence were the foundations of the regime. Terror, to be effective, had to be arbitrary and ruthless. It had to be widespread enough to reach everyone." But did, not, but did not have to claim many lives. The principle was well understood. Kill a chicken to scare the monkey was a traditional saying. Cadres who forced villagers in Tongzhou, just outside the capital, to kneel before beating them called it punish one to deter a hundred. Um, and then we get into some examples like... Uh, Okay, I'll read this paragraph. So, in any event, as the promise of utopia was followed by yet another spell of back-breaking labor, the willingness to trade, to trade hard work for empty promises gradually eroded. Soon, the only way to extract compliance from an exhausted workforce was the threat of violence. Nothing short of fear of hunger, pain, or death seemed to be able to galvanize them. In some in some places, both villagers and cadres became so brutalized that the scope and degree of coercion had to be constantly expanded, creating a mounting spiral of violence. With far fewer carrots to offer, the party relied more heavily on the stick. And of course, examples of the stick um, are pretty much endless. Um, but here's what Wu Desheng, party secretary of a commune in Hunan, single-handedly uh he single-handedly punched 150 people 150 people of whom four died he he said um to his new recruits if you want to be a party member you must know how to beat people in daoxian county 
Everywhere is a torture field, an investigation team wrote. Farmers were clubbed on a regular basis. One team leader personally beat 13 people to death. A further nine subsequently died of their injuries. Some of these cadres were veritable gangsters, their mere appearance instilling fear. In Nanhai County, Brigade Leader Liang Lan Wang, or Yan Long, toted three guns and stalked the village in a big leather coat. Li Xian Chun, team leader in Hebei, injected himself with morphine daily and would swagger about the village in bright red tr- in, in bright red trousers, swearing loudly and randomly beating anybody who had the misfortune to catch his attention. Overall, across the country, maybe as many as half of all cadres regularly pummeled or caned the people they were meant to serve, as endless reports demonstrate. It goes on to write that probably around, uh, based on these reports, probably around six to eight percent of the people who died in this in these four peri- in these four years were beaten to death or otherwise, um, you know, killed or murdered in some way actively, not just who died from starvation or disease. And just goes on to to elucidate all the different ways in which this happened. Um, you know, I talked about grandma. One 80-year-old woman who had the temerity to report her team leader for stealing rice paid the price when she was drenched in urine. Um, This was because boiling water was often poured over people as a punishment, but when water became scarce, then it was common to cover them in urine and feces. Um, In Longhui commune near Shantou, those who failed to keep up with work were pushed into a heap of excrement, forced to drink urine, or had their hands burned, etc., etc., Uh, Mutilation was carried out everywhere. Hair was ripped out. Ears and noses were lopped off. After Chun Di, a farmer in Guangdong, stole some food, he was tied up by militiaman Chen Chiu, who cut off one of his ears. The case of Wang Ziyu Ziyu was was reported to central leadership. One One of his ears was chopped off, his legs were tied up with wire, a 10-kilo stone was dropped on his back, and then he was branded with a hot iron, as punishment for digging up a potato. Sometimes wives and husbands were forced to beat each other, a few to death. One elderly man, when interviewed for this book in 2006, quietly sobbed when, sobbed when, he, when he recounted how, as a young boy, he and other villagers had been forced to beat a grandmother, tied up in the local temple for having taken wood from the forest. People were intimidated by mock mock executions and mock burials. Humiliation was the trusted companion of pain. Everywhere people were paraded, sometimes with a dunce cap, sometimes with a placard on their chests, sometimes entirely naked. Faces were smeared with black ink. People were given yin and yang haircuts, as one half of the head was shaved, the other not. Verbal abuse was rife. The Red Guards, ten years later during the Cultural Revolution, invented very little. So all this stuff was going on. At this time. Um, well. <laughs> I, yeah, you want me to keep going or not? <laughs> so, Please cut in, Elon. Uh, the, so uh, uh, a lot of those facts, I, I knew it was bad. Um, we, we had, uh, a few of us had seen a film called Farewell, My Concubine, which is an excellent film. It's about 25 years old and depicts some of these um, psychological terror tactics on the part of the party of Mao. Uh, that were inflicted on people uh, who had to denounce one one another, uh, intimates that had to publicly uh, shame one another uh, by force of violence. And um, it's easily, you know, one of the most horrific, uh, stomach-churning, gut-wrenching things to to know that uh, has transpired and in uh, contemporary history and uh, implemented at a state level, uh, implemented uh, through an organized system of political control that uh, has, uh, that's basically terrorizing its public. Now it's very, uh, it's very challenging for me to hear all that and to not look at what's happening all around us today. And to know, to know that many of these organizations that are uh, doing what they're doing, uh, particularly in the U.S., but in other places also, are financed, are organized 
by some of the richest, most powerful people uh, in the Western world, uh, all for political purposes. Th these are the uh, the, the state-run terrorists. This is a, a foretaste of, of things to come. It may change form. It may uh, it may change to look like a, a federalized police force. But make no mistake, this is uh, this is state terror, uh, and if it, it it's it's being supported by um, by political leaders. Uh, you know, there there are guys like Michael Bloomberg, billionaire um, entrepreneur, who who has been uh, paying for the bail of individuals in prison in Florida, uh, basically on the unspoken condition that they vote Democratic. You had Kamala Harris in an interview with Stephen Colbert saying that these so-called protests will not end they will not end they will not end as if she has a hand in uh in knowing if not supporting uh these violent movements uh and looking at the bigger picture here and just taking a step back these are all the same people who are uh promoting and are uh, in cahoots with and in union with uh, big tech and surveillance and a new economy and a universal basic income that would have most people completely at the mercy of the state who will hold their universal basic income, basically hold their digital paychecks hostage until it's proven that they do exactly what they say, which in this case, and our, our sister show, Objective Health has been covering this quite extensively, uh, all kinds of vaccines with, with digital information and, and levels of, of control over us that you can't even imagine, that sound like complete science fiction, and yet... These are things that are being rolled out bit by bit. So once again, we have this people's movement. We have this anti-fascist movement, this anti-racist movement that's pummeling a, a society into submission that is a, attacking people willy-nilly everywhere, forcing them to comply, forcing them to take the knee. I mean, this is, this is Mao's China. Right there. This is Stalinist Russia, Bolshe Bolshevik Russia, right now, right here. We're seeing it. Except that there is a plan going forward. And the plan, uh, probably unbeknownst to most of these mindless, hystericized dupes who are committing all of these atrocities, who are destroying the lives of many of the people they profess to want to protect uh, and help the minorities with small businesses, these dupes, these numbskulls, these people with character deficiencies, these people who are on the dole for uh, the, the, the money and the paychecks and the hotel rooms that they're getting flown around to and from across the U.S. and armed, basically, with all kinds of riot gear, all of these dupe idiots are uh, basically helping to usher in a system of totalitarian control that that is a hundred times worse than anything than any kind of any level of racism any level of police brutality that we're seeing today it's going to make it's going to make you know everything that we've seen prior to the last uh period of time look like a sunday picnic so uh again it, it's very difficult for for me, it's a challenge not to see how all of this is playing out right before our eyes. And um, this is a, a an article I've referred to on a previous show. James Corbett discusses the Agora, or the, the meeting of exchange, the place where people with a, a normal, uh, health, relatively healthy 
um, psychological worldview and and sense of of values can exchange value with one another and try as much as possible anyway to to do life sustaining things to maintain normal relationships and community and to exist again as much as possible outside of a system that would that would seek to control your every thought and move that would seek to suppress any thought of uh, of personal sovereignty, of 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 healthy relationships. So um, that that's how I think this uh, you know this kind of alliance with her panorogenic union, as Lobachevsky would call it. Um, takes on this much larger and much more damaging um, set of implications. Yeah, it doesn't look good. I mean, it, it really, it doesn't look good, but, you know, history, it, you know, it does, it's educational, but it's not like a, you know, you can't say 100% that history will repeat exactly the way that it, it has in the past or that people haven't learned on some level and will make different choices um, or that it'll just turn out um, not the way that a lot of these individuals with these, with these like just bizarrely clownish self-serving um, agendas that that they just won't fall right in their face trying mm -hmm. to implement them, you know? Because that's I think that's the, another interesting thing is that you know these days people just aren't made of the same stuff that they were back then. You know, I mean, even the villains, it seems like even the villains in our drama are, don't have the, the same kind of um, spine that the villains had back then or the ability to, I don't know, yeah. co form coherent sentences. <laughs> the, <laughs> that, uh, uh, there's just, there seems to be uh, something, um, I don't know, there's, I, that you can't, you know, I don't want to say, ah, you know, have hope or you know, or something weird like that. But I have, I have, I'm perennial, a perennial optimist just because of, you know, the simple fact that I'm not a materialist. So I don't, and that, you know, when you have, when you have faith, you just, um, you know, you don't have, you don't worry, right? You don't worry as much when you have faith because uh, faith means that things work out the way that they're supposed to work out. Well, you, you talked about them falling on the, you know, p potentially falling on their faces, um, and failing in this endeavor, I kind of like you. Uh, there's an optimistic streak, streak to me, but also a pessimist, and they all, they often like battle with one another. So, on the one hand, I see the things Ilan's talking about. I, I'm I'm reading. I, I haven't finished reading it yet. It's it's not a long article, but uh, by Rod. I think his name's Rod Dreher. Um, it's an article on the American Conservative, I believe. It's an excerpt from his book that's coming out in a week or two called Live Not By Lies. And it's all about the, um, the essentially the plan and the, the trajectory that, that we're on to create basically a social credit state, like they've, you know, they're, they're starting to implement and already have implemented to certain degrees in China. And, and how he describes it as a soft totalitarianism. So basically how all of the work is done essentially by AI and um, all this computer technology to to harvest and analyze and like all of this data, all of this social media data and, you know, everything, all your digital footprint in order to to manage your life and how that can be done without a lot of human intervention. And of course, that's one of the scary things about it, but that that, that eliminates the need for a lot of the um, <clears throat> a lot of the features of the totalitarianisms of the 20th century, um, and the, the resulting kind of, I guess you could call it like deaths and poverty and all of these things. Like you could basically, you can have a totalitarian system without a lot of the traditionally bad features of totalitarianism because it's just such a, a well-run machine, kind of like brave new world. Like there's a, there's a dichotomy. There's a, com a contrast between 1984 and brave new world. Like uh, Orwell's 1984 is classic, like pathocracy in a, in all its kind of raw brutality, um, 
but Brave New World is kind of this this pseudo utopia that doesn't actually have any or any or very much at all actual like pathology in it but it's a it's a system that is at the same time um as terrifying or or more terrifying in a, in a, in a way because it's this perfectly run machine that uh that totally disregards the the individual and will just uh, you know so there's no there's not even any room for dissent to a large degree and so there's this this conflict in my mind at the same time with these two models um because on the one hand you can have you there's the potential there's always the potential for a violent revolution to lead to a um a pathocracy you know as defined by Lobachevsky where it's like at, you know at every level you, the 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 guy above you is just a total uh criminal and then there's the the society where it's pretty much like as you would imagine a normal society but things are in this kind of bizarro land where you just never think about the things that are going wrong you never acknowledge them and you're you're not even aware that anything's going wrong um you're because you're so completely brain, brainwashed to go along with the system um so that you can like in brave new world live a completely hedonistic and and satisfying life on one level and not even realize that you're in prison and then there's the that that contrast to the first option where you know you're in prison mm-hmm. and it's it's very obvious to you um and each is terrifying in its own way but one thing that that I like to keep in mind that uh, you know I'm reminded of by reading this this book on the great leap backwards was that things have a tendency to develop in an organic way that really can't be controlled or even ordered from the top like he makes the point that in every single county in every single like village the the cadre is like so the party leaders in in each of in, of the smallest divisions of like the geography of of China they all engaged in using food as a weapon so if you didn't do something you you your ration got smaller and smaller you know to the point where some people you know didn't get anything and starved to death and everyone was using using this means to keep the population in line but there was never any order from the top to do this and as far as i can tell from reading the book the top leadership wasn't even aware that this was going on for for a period of time mm-hmm. because it it was really a a grassroots movement among the among the cadres at the low levels to implement these things because it was the only thing they could do and because there were certain personality types that of course had gained these positions because like i said a few weeks ago or whenever it was um when you have an impossible goal an impossible policy an impossible policy then it's impossible to implement so like he mentions you you have to start using violence as a as a um you have to use the stick as opposed to the carrot more frequently because you're trying to get people to reach an impossible goal and then when things go wrong there's going to be a purge of the ranks and the people that get purged are the 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 bleeding hearts and the the pansies and the people that don't get the job done the ones that get the job done are the liars and the the murderers and the the torturers and then that opens up once there's this purge where you get rid of um even a lot of the bad the bad dudes that were you know doing stuff but they just they didn't have the the uh intestinal fortitude to to lie to their superiors to make it look like things were better than they are or whatever for whatever reason all these guys are gone and now there's all these openings in the ranks so now the party swells not only replaces all these members but swells by several million and the people that they choose are the ones that uh are are all the criminals that weren't in the party yet who now get a position so it's it's this uh this distillation and this uh this process where the 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 ruling class the 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 communist party gets more saturated with criminal personalities and while all of this is happening again the the top leadership um isn't even aware of it they're not even they don't have no, any idea what's going on they're reading the reports from the people below them that are saying everything's fine and so they're like oh great so we 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 just, we've just had a, a bumper crop year and a bumper harvest so so that means we can export like 60% of our our of our harvest to to meet our foreign debts or to you know to to send them to um the like east germany or whatever and meanwhile the all of the all the lower lower levels are inflating their harvest numbers in order to please the the top and when they take away 60% they're left with practically nothing so they have nothing to feed the the people with 
So the, the, the top leadership is sending all, pr like practically for all intents and purposes, all the grain outside of the country and leaving practically nothing for the people to eat. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, millions of people starve to death is because there was literally nothing to eat because of all the, the every layer of lies. So even without, and it's the same thing with uh, Nazi Germany, even mm -hmm. without direct orders from the top to implement some kind of policy, it's the, it's the nature of the process and the nature of um, just what happens to humans in a situation like this, mm -hmm. that this is the sort of thing that happens. Mm -hmm. And so the, this is the pessimist part of me that's saying, even if there's this, this plan by these pansy criminals, these pansy villains that we have these days who are just total like milk toasts, that, uh, that even even with them as it is, that doesn't mean that things will be any better on the on the on the low levels, like on the in in your town, in your city, on the streets, um, because things can go horribly wrong at that level just by the nature of the the um, the way things are run. Whether it's by some AI or whether it's by some you know idiot like Mao it's you, you might you might end up getting the same results but on the subject of just you know, pansy villains in this paper that in this article I was reading from uh, Dreyer I think his name is he talks about how one of the primary motivations for this is it's simply big tech companies um, looking for market opportunities and on one level, I believe that's totally true that a lot of these people that are that are pushing forward this thing this this uh, this this brave new world of the social credit system, all they're looking for is market opportunities. Of course, there are some with probably more nefarious agendas, you know, in mind. But these big tech companies are just saying, "Oh, here's an emerging market um, for all of these like uh, social engineering and, and social credit technologies." Well, let's get in. On, let's get in on this. And because now we have an interest in um, in getting in on social credit and, and implementing it, they become essentially lobbyists for it and make it more likely to. To happen in the future because it's just the natural trajectory of things so you have these these people who aren't even like good villains they're just the the most boring kind of like um bureaucrat or capitalist you know venture capitalists who are just uh nothing to write home about you couldn't write you couldn't make a movie about these guys because they're so boring but this is the kind of stuff that they're implementing just because uh they see an emerging market in the social credit technologies which is uh you know, is that how we're going to go down? <laughs> you know? Well, it, if I had to guess, um, I would say that there's going to be a, a, a amalgamation and in, in, in some areas we'll have this brave new world, uh, internet of things, uh, kind of semi-functional, uh, town or city in, in other sections, there'll be opportunities for, uh, the roughest, toughest, most high-tech, kick-ass, sociopathic police forces that are busting heads, and 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 that'll and that'll work there. Um, you know, you mentioned how the the local leaders um, and and criminals were doing things outside of the purview of the top leadership in China, mm -hmm. and it it just made me think of how you know hearing. Uh, from you know, from the White House, wittingly or unwittingly, all all of this information or or non information on the subject of uh, the virus uh, has given permission to, um, in their minds, many leaders on a local level acting batshit yeah. crazy mm -hmm. uh, and exercising every bit of swaggering uh, authoritarian policy that their deep dark subconscious could act you know could muster and, and bring into the fore all to save lives Ilan. it's all, all to save lives all to save lives of course goes without saying right in the meantime they uh they're making alliances with other powerful people in the party of you know in the virus party in the technocracy party in the party of uh of ideological political correctness in the party of, uh, you know, there's like a whole constellation of beliefs and policies that are based on lies that that seem to be interlocking, and they all, you know, they they all kind of work together. They're all kind of of a piece, and um, 
and so you know it, it, it's like after 9/11 all, all of the all of the security companies with with all of their technology you know the you know uh who is it Robert Chertoff who is part of Homeland Security or Michael uh, you know goes into goes into private industry for himself and and sells the TSA all of these uh, DNA destroying uh uh x-ray machines you know it it's just uh this revolving door of political corporate fascist um uh, accrual of power and money um because it it's become the you know the new the new business model essentially and uh and like you were saying i'm sure a lot of them are are a lot of these criminals go go to board meetings and have no awareness of the the implications of what they're doing uh of how their technology you know their contact tracing and their you know and their uh whatever part of this new infrastructure they're working on how it actually serves the exact opposite of of their brand of of what they're saying it's supposed to help people with so um incredible incredible to watch and incredible also to to see how low tech versions of this phenomena uh with mao with the bolsheviks with stalin uh and on the far right you know with nazi germany and and mussolini who had the trains running on time all these guys you know they they were all the the kind of modern progenitors of uh uh of this uh of this incredible movement we're seeing. And I, you know, I hope Corey, like, I, I know that that was, um, it, it sounded pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic. <laughs> uh, I hope I didn't, I didn't convey a pessimism that was over the top. It's just a, it's more of a disgust, I think. And, um, and I am optimistic. I think there, you know, when you really talk to people, uh, a lot of people do know, do have some idea of of what's happening, <clears throat> and uh, that's very uh, it's very heartening. It's well, very. You, I don't I don't uh, uh, subscribe to that kind of optimism. I have George Carlin's optimism, which is, I you know I have uh, I I don't have my money really on on a good ending on a happy ending. I'm just going to enjoy the show. <laughs> You know, just enjoy Basically, it. Th yeah. There's life after death. Yeah, the, yeah. That's why I said I like a um, optimistic because I'm not a materialist. You know, I'm not putting all my uh, my hopes on the continuation of the universe on whether or not humanity can make a decent decision. That would be the dumbest bet <laughs> that you could possibly make. I think. I mean, mm -hmm. my optimism is that um, you know it's a religious optimism. A, you know, a, a deeper a deeper faith. Uh, than you know, hoping that you know people are going to wake up or or you know something like that. But well, that that at least a a, a portion of the population, um, even if it doesn't speak for all of humanity, it is uh, working towards some level of awareness. Do I put my do I hang my hopes on it? No. Um, do I? Do I think that it presents some opportunities? Yes, uh, and that's at least a hope. It, it's not a it's not a certain guarantee mm -hmm. by any stretch. And I also share your your uh, non materialist faith in a higher order of things that uh, that will last and 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 keep things going to some degree or another and how we got to the subject from the criminal mind uh well i guess it makes a certain amount of sense i, I guess we're trying to take this to its logical conclusion mm -hmm. to some degree well and i think that we've made it there so uh that is going to be it for this week's show we hope you enjoyed it um we'll have links to the the books that we were uh, discussing if you want to check them out um, thank you very much for tuning in everybody and you have a wonderful week